Okay, folks, good evening. I'm uh, Frankie Marston, the Atlanta Swim Association Swim League Coordinator. Uh, we'll be getting underway with tonight's meeting. Uh, with me is Evan Eilander. He'll be our moderator for tonight's meeting. Uh, he will relay any questions that you guys have, and uh, we'll try and keep this thing as brief as possible. We do have a lot of good stuff we're going to cover tonight. If you got questions, feel free to ask them throughout the meeting. We will record this and send this out to the teams. With that said, I'm going to turn off my video, but keep my audio on, and hopefully you guys will continue to hear what I'm saying. So, purpose of tonight's meeting is to cover specifically the how to run a swim meet. Um, it's getting into the details of the jobs are involved in a meet, the stuff you need to run a meet, and then also just the general processes of how paperwork makes its way around the deck possible conflict resolution if that comes up that usually pertains to the weather more than anything else and then just kind of general advice as to what personalities fit what jobs how those jobs interact and as always the communication part of what we're doing as coordinators coaches integrating you know interfacing with parents and volunteers and their jobs and trying to make all that stuff run as smoothly as possible because we're running an event literally with hundreds of athletes Hundreds of parents. Some of the parents are crazy. I'll, I'll just warn you that. We all know that youth sports has their fair share of that. With all that said, as always, with everything we do with the league, I am always here as a resource to answer phone calls, emails, texts, cries for help, someone to, ye someone to yell at, shoulder to cry on, whatever you need. If you've got questions or problems during the year, don't hesitate. Call me, email me, and let me know. And I work, you know, it's... <laughs> what i'm here for i'm here to help you guys out to be successful your volunteers and what you're doing and you're in charge of usually fairly large organizations of a very complex you know process so what we want to do is make this stuff as fun and easy and approachable as possible um and doing that usually involves me trying to help you guys out by answering questions and giving advice wherever i can my phone number email address are listed all throughout the presentations on the league website. I'm not a hard guy to get in touch with. And if you can't get me on the phone or via email, that's probably because I'm helping somebody else out. So as Evan mentioned in the Zoom portion of this, we just ask you guys to either you know raise your hand or use the chat feature to ask any questions. And if your questions aren't answered by the end of the you know the meeting, we'll stick around for a few extra minutes to cover that. First and foremost, be sure to update your team info. Uh, that is, if you go on the league website, asa.swimtopia.com, it lists a link for ASA teams. Go look at your team page. Make sure you are listed on there, you know, your team reps, your coaches, any key people that you need to communicate with. You, usually teams will put their computer people on there. Make sure that stuff is updated and current. Make sure that the address of the pool is right, that the specs on the pool are correct. If you're in a five-lane pool, it also helps. Go ahead. If you know that, hey, we're going to use lane one or lane five as the exhibition lane in our pool, put that info on there by the number of lanes. It just makes it a little bit easier to communicate that and avoid cross-ups when you're doing lineup exchanges and things like that. Additionally, under the people section and the roles that are listed on that Swimtopia site, you need to make sure that all of your team reps, all of your key you know, management people on your team, your computer people, and all of your coaches are designated with one of the three linked ASA roles. There's a little blue badge on that page. When you look next to a person, next to the roles, that needs to get updated every year. That includes you in the communication loop for the league. So whenever I send emails out, and they will start coming hot and heavy as we approach the season, when I send out periodic things like weekly newsletters, Reminders about the championship meet, deadline reminders, process reminders about how the championship meet's going to work. If you're on that list and you're in one of those link roles, you're going to get the communications. If you're not, well, guess what? You're going to be in the dark. So, again, it makes your job a little bit more challenging because you're having to guess what we're trying to communicate. And we try to relay what is working and what is not working during the season. We try to learn in every single meet that we have What's, you know, what makes things run smoothly? What th makes things not run so smoothly? We try to share that and provide feedback to teams as much as we can. 
full information on how to do this is linked on these pages. Easy to do. Just make sure you go ahead and check that and make sure it's correct. Next slide, Evan. So for your meets, communication is crucial on a bunch of fronts. First and foremost, between the teams. The home team initiates a conversation early in the week. And honestly, that communication lane already should have been opened. Teams should go ahead and reach out to their opponents. Make sure we start getting the general ideas about, hey, when we come to a meet, where are we going to sit? When are we going to warm up? What is parking like? What can we do to keep our HOA happy? The earlier you get that sorted out and you work out things like, hey, the weather doesn't look real good this week. Let's talk about alternative plans, how long we're willing to wait. If we're going to reschedule, what date are we going to reschedule for? Can it be at the home team's pool? Does it have to be at the visiting team's pool? Okay, work all that stuff out in advance when it's a conversation between you and a limited other audience. If you try to do that stuff on the fly in the middle of a swim meet in a thunderstorm, it's not always a very clean, happy process. That tends to be the one place teams get really tripped up. We have more conflict than any, anywhere else. So that early pre-meet communication really pays off in a big way. It helps make everyone's experience much more palatable, smooth, fun, enjoyable. You know, and again, you've got a lot of folks coming to a place they may not, they may not have been before. So again, plan ahead. Hey, our pool doesn't have a lot of shade. You probably want to bring extra pop-up tents. Make sure your kids have shade when it's 105 degrees and it's hot as all blazes on the deck. Work out the details of lineup exchange. Who's going to be the key point of contact? Is it the coach? Is it the computer person? You know, do we need to push things off from the scheduled 3 p.m. deadline because somebody's work schedule doesn't allow them to get it done before, say, 6 o'clock? Just, again, work that stuff out in advance. It minimizes conflict in a big way. Communication with your families is really important. Get word out early about volunteer jobs and positions, their expectations for their jobs, when they're supposed to be there, where they're supposed to be, what they're supposed to do. Contingency plans for the weather. Get that out to them as early as possible so you don't have the rumor mill take over. That's the biggest challenge most teams have when the weather goes sideways is every parent's now an, a meteorologist and they're all obviously clued in on every last thing that's going on with the team. They will completely torpedo your efforts and have half the team leave because like, oh, I heard the meet's canceled. Well, no, both teams agreed to wait until seven o'clock before they made any kind of decision. Okay. Additionally, communicate in advance. What happens in bad weather? Where does everybody go? Do they go to the clubhouse? Is there a nice big building? Everyone can go to safety. Is there not a lot of room inside or safety? Do people need to go back to their cars? Are the cars safe? Is the, is the street you're on leading into the pool lined with a bunch of old growth trees that might drop a branch on somebody's Volvo? You know, is it safer to just go, hey, there's a Publix down the road. Go park there. I actually, I had a great experience with that. My, one of my kids was playing baseball. And we hit, I mean, absolutely borderline tornado. We left. We got off the property because they told us it's probably not safe to park around here. We came back after the storm, and no joke, there were trees down everywhere. If we had stayed parked on that street, my car would have been crushed with me in it. Probably not a good thing. So, again, communicate that up, up in advance. Communicate with your referee. The home team is the primary point of contact with the ref for the meet. They need to confirm with that person roughly 24 hours before the meet is starting. Hey, are you coming? You know, you know you're on the schedule. Hey, here's where you can park. I'm so-and-so. I'll be wearing a red hat. Come find me when you get here. Our coach is going to be here. Get those details worked out in advance. Communicate with your neighborhood and your HOA. They have become far more invasive and aggressive, sometimes for good, sometimes not for good. But in a lot of cases, it's an imposition on the HOA to have hundreds of people come park on the street. So try and avoid getting in their crosshairs because they can be your best friend and they can be your worst enemy, okay? Communicate with them well in advance of the season. Work out the details. Try and make it as minimally impactful for them as possible, but also try to have a good working relationship with them. 
you're bringing a whole lot of business there. What a lot of people join the pool because they want to be on the swim team. And it's probably cheaper to be on the swim team if you're a member of the HOA and the pool board and all that other good stuff. So you're bringing a lot of foot traffic to them and a lot of people that will use the facility and will be engaged. And when they want to raise money to spend on those facilities, these are people like, yeah, we spend a lot of time at the pool. It'd be great if we had, you know, new starting blocks or a new clubhouse or whatever else. But if you're adversarial with them, it becomes more and more difficult. I watch one HOA, they ran a team out of business. They called the Board of Health on the concession stand. And the Board of Health showed up at the swim meets like, no, you can't do that. It was like, what are you doing? It's like, it's just not a happy situation. So, like I said, communication's key. Next slide. Competition is a part of ASA and the experience of being on a team, but it is not the end-all, be-all of why we're doing this. This is still supposed to be fun and approachable and enjoyable. It's summer league. I get on that soapbox every year and try and bang it into people's heads, but this is supposed to be fun and enjoyable. But fun and enjoyable does not mean just do whatever you want whenever you want to do it. We try to design processes for how we run these meets, the rules of the league, and you know, have some structure in there so you guys can have a somewhat common experience from one meet to the next. Now, sometimes that takes some fine tuning, maybe thinking outside of the box, maybe doing something that might be a little bit outside the scope of what the rule book says, but it's more a matter of fitting things to your facility and your situation. We usually try to dance to the same music on this stuff and the way that we do things, the way we collect times, the way we record times, the way some of these jobs work, they need to kind of stick under the same plan and, you know, go according to our instructions. So, again, communicate with your opposing team to iron out all the details. Map out your plan for the day to ensure all the paperwork's done in a timely fashion and ready to go. Make sure your volunteers know what their jobs are and how to do them. Don't take the newbie and make them a place judge. That's kind of an important role. You know, don't take somebody that's never seen a swim meet before and make them a timer unless they understand, you know, how does the stopwatch work? Okay, there's nothing more frustrating for a referee or other meat workers to have people in those jobs. They get overwhelmed and they, you know, they feel bad about it. They want to do the best job they can, but if they're not equipped for the task, probably you set them up to not be successful. Communicate your team lineup to your families as early as possible. Say so know what their kids are swimming. And they can take care of the challenge of riding on the kids' arms, heat and lane. You don't have to have the coaches do that for five hours and get carpal tunnel doing that stuff. Hey, parents, here's, you know, go to Swimtopia. Here's what your kids are swimming tonight. They're in event 15, heat one, lane four. They're in event 26, heat two, lane six. Okay. That way they kind of know what's going on. Again, help is always a phone call or email away from yours truly, from Evan. And also another good group. I mean, I'm sitting here looking at a really helpful person up there in Jen Matthews, but other coaches and coordinators who have been doing this for a while are usually very happy to help you and steer you in the right direction if you're struggling. Okay. There are no bad questions. This is new for a lot of people. So you're brand new to this. It's going to feel like drinking from the fire hose. So the question you ask might not just help you. It may help 10 other people. So don't be bashful. There are no bad questions. I am always happy to answer whatever I can answer. So next slide, ASA website. We've got it at asasymptopia.com. Schedule's on there. All the meetings, everything else that we run, those are always posted on there and available under the latest news section. ASA required items. Job requirements and job descriptions are on pages six through eight of the league rule book. Another thing on that ASA website is the league rule book. Okay, meet referees, their specific duties, what they get paid, what they're doing, what they're supposed to do, what they're not supposed to do is on pages three, seven, and 13. The general rules, what governs a swim meet in our league is covered on pages nine through 17. It's not a ton of stuff. That rule book's like 35 pages, but Really, the crux of what applies to us is covered in that first 15 to 20 pages of the rule book. Line of exchange is specifically covered in link pages 11 and 12. The dual meet timeline, what happens leading up to the meet, day of the meet, 
during the meet and after the meet are all covered on pages 18 through 20. That's kind of a good roadmap of what goes on during a meet. Next slide, meet referees. So ASA schedules refs for each meet. We send out a schedule three to four days in advance of the meet. And it's gonna have that person's name, email, and phone number. It's a responsibility of the home team to reach out to that person to confirm that they're gonna be there, get them their info. Okay, one other quick reminder, we always tell teams, if you can, save a spot for the referee to park. They are not gonna get there three hours in advance of your meet. They're usually gonna get there about, you know, 15 to 30 minutes before a meet starts. They're coming from work, they're fighting traffic just like everybody else. And if they get there and they gotta park a mile away and walk, they're gonna probably be late and it's gonna start your meet late. So we wanna try and avoid that. Just save them a spot. If you can't get in touch with your referee by six o'clock the night before the meet, that is an immediate phone call or email to me. Hey, we're trying to get in touch with this person, but we have not heard back from them. That gets it on my radar to A, reach out to them myself, and B, also, to go ahead and start the process of possibly finding a replacement if we need one, okay? But I can't do that if you call me at four o'clock the day of the meet. Meet starts at an hour, hour and a half, and I gotta get somebody from Buckhead to Alpharetta. That ain't happening. It's just not, it's very unlikely that I can find somebody on that short of notice. But if you let me know six o'clock the night before the meet, I can guarantee we're gonna have somebody there. They are paid $100 per meet. It's split evenly between the two teams. They prefer check or they love cash or Venmo is another good one. Tipping is okay. It sounds silly, but honestly, if you get a good ref that runs an efficient, quick, well-run, organized meet, there's nothing wrong with throwing an extra 10, 20 bucks per team. Be discreet about it. Don't walk up there in the middle of the meet and hand them a 50 going, hey, keep it fair, like Caddyshack, okay? If they're running late, they should communicate. They should let you know, hey, I'm sorry I'm stuck in traffic, car trouble, whatever else. But if they're running late, don't wait interminably to get the meet started. If that happens, get the coaches together, have them designate either a parent with officiating experience or they can do it themselves. They can split the duties up themselves and just kind of self-officiate. Only coaches and head team reps should have any interaction with the meet ref during a meet. That means no parents, no kids, no hothead. I know everything. I'm certified level in whatever, and I've worked the Olympic trials. Unless I send them there to referee the meet, they have no standing there. Okay? Keep them away from the meet referee. You don't see parents walking onto the field in the middle of a baseball game talking to the umpire. Okay, we just don't, we have a very, very low tolerance for any kind of interference like that at our events. You guys know in youth sports, that stuff is becoming more and more prevalent these days with just awful stuff. And it such, such, sets such a horrible example for these kids. So again, you guys are the point of contact. And if you do have any discussion or interaction with the ref, I tell you what I told everybody else in the last meeting, it will be civil. It will be professional. It will be polite. You can disagree with them all you want, but you're going to be polite and civil about it. Set a good example. There's nothing wrong with asking a referee, I have a question about this dis disqualification. Was it the correct lane? What was the stroke offense? Okay. Was it the correct heat? Was it recorded correctly on the paperwork? Did it get input correctly into the computer? Those are all very reasonable questions to ask when a child is dis disqualified, okay? And trust me, they're only gonna DQ kids that are, I mean, slam dunk cases. They're not, they don't DQ anybody in the exhibition heats. They DQ kids in the scoring heats and it's usually for a whopper. Kid swims in, does a massive one hand touch and a butterfly, okay? Kids, you know, dives in in a breaststroke race and swims three strokes of freestyle. Those are gonna be, you know, it's gonna be the big picture stuff. They're not out there with a microscope looking to deal with this. If there's a rain out, the ref still gets paid. If, if the, unless you scrub the meat before it even started, you still are going to pay the referee the full freight of the 100 bucks. If the meat or the portion of the meat is rescheduled, the ref gets paid 
$100 again for the rescheduled portion, even if it's five events, okay? Just works out that way. On the rescheduled meet, if that happens, the home team picks up the full cost of the referee. Here's why. The home team has concessions. They've got, you know, the concession stand to help, frankly, fund this whole thing. Visiting team doesn't have that benefit. They can budget in, you know, paying for the ref and their normal fees. They can't account for an unexpected expense. Stuff you need to run a swim meet. Next slide, please, Evan. It's on page six. Obviously, starting blocks, provided the pool is deep enough. Chairs behind each lane. We usually suggest having two per lane if you've got, got it available. That's usually more of a real estate thing. Some teams don't have chairs behind the blocks because it's real tight back there. The chairs just take up too much space. But usually the chairs help pre-stage kids and line them up a couple of heats in advance. Backstroke flags at each end. Lane ropes, lane markers, PA system, okay? Bullhorn for the starter, all this stuff. Amazon is like your best friend, okay? A starting signal could be a whistle, could be an electronic start. More and more teams are using the Colorado electronic starts. They tend to be nice. It's got its own little internal PA, plus it's easy to hear. Stopwatches, again, the home team is going to provide Technically, each team should bring their own stopwatches for their own lanes, but the home team ought to have at least six, eight, however many lanes your pool is, plus a couple of spares, just in case. Every once in a while, the parent that's in charge of bringing the stopwatches, they forget them. So having what you need on hand helps. Again, same thing, Amazon, okay? Check them now. Make sure your batteries are working, that they're, they're functional. Make sure the buttons still work. You, you got two options on these. You can buy the more expensive $30, $40 stopwatches. They tend to last longer. However, stopwatches get lost. You're only going to use them for five meets during the year. Okay. Buying the five or $10 version, you know, buying a ton of those is usually kind of an easier way to go about it. Table, possibly a tent for scoring for the computer stuff. Everyone's got Swimtopia. You need a computer, laptop, and printer. You need Wi-Fi connection at the pool. Got to have connectivity there. Additionally, make sure that that Wi-Fi is dependable and not, ideally, not open to the general public. When 500 people are trying to use the free Wi-Fi at the pool, it bogs it down. So if you need to buy an extra hotspot or carve out a little, you know, spot of connectivity inside of your own network, that's fine. Or just get another router. You know, get something else that's specifically dedicated for swim team use. It just tends to work a little bit better. Again, best practice, visiting teams should still always bring their computer, their printer to an away meet. All this stuff is networked in the cloud, so both teams could be entering times. It's a possibility during the meet. Okay, but also it affords the visiting team the ability to print whatever paperwork they need, heat sheets, check-in forms, you know, whatever forms and paperwork they need for their use, they can print them. The visiting team should never show up at a meet expecting the home team to give them 50 copies of the heat sheet. Doesn't work that way. Okay, the visiting team should come equipped with their own stuff. People need to do a run and meet. That is also on page six. Two deck managers, and I'll get into the details of what these people are and what they do in just a moment. One from each team, one announcer, that comes from the home team. Start a referee, that's provided by the league. Two place judges, one from each team. Lane timers, two, from each, two for each lane. You're gonna time your own lanes. The exception to that is, if you are using electronic timing equipment to operate your meet and you have two inputs, two plungers, two dolphin watches, two time drop fobs, whatever else for that lane, you're gonna mix the timers. One from the home team, one from the away team. So we get, frankly, an equal voting share, so to speak, in that process. Otherwise, if you're just using stopwatches, each team can time their own line. Two master recorders, one from each team, one runner, that comes from the home team, two computer operators, one from each team, and two ribbon workers, one from each team. Home team checklist, page number six. Number one, confirm with the rep at least 24 hours before the meet. 
provide all the ribbons for the heat one events. That's what was in your boxes. So again, you're gonna provide all the heat one stuff. Each team is responsible for providing their own ribbons for their exhibition swimmers. If you try to just take all the stuff from my own team, you're gonna run through their ribbons really quick. And the reason for that is quite simply, every team's different size, you know, age group breakups, breakdowns and so forth. So again, the easiest way for, for us to account for this is using your roster numbers from the previous year and calculating what you need from a ribbon standpoint. As far as ribbons go, teams should have picked them up today. If for some reason you go through the season and you had a bigger team than you expected and you're running low on ribbons, I'm looking at you, Phil Stone. Call me as soon as you realize it. And you'll know it. You'll, you'll be at that meet that night. So that's like a Friday morning thing for a Thursday meet or, you know, Wednesday morning for our Tuesday teams. That is not a Thursday morning, oh, by the way, we're low on third place ribbons. Can't help you much at that point. If you let me know several days in advance, I will, frankly, just mail them to you. No cost. Doesn't cost you anything. Okay? Otherwise, if it's convenient for you, I can also just put them on my front porch. You can swing by and get them. But ideally, if you let me know in advance, I can have them mailed to you. They'll get to you within a day or two. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. So. Home team prepares the pool by handling all the paperwork, making sure all the needed paperwork is printed, set up the pool, lay the deck out the way it needs to be, okay, to be able to hand things over to the starter referee. Provide water for all the meat workers. I had a situation a couple of years ago, 90 plus degrees on the deck. They're walking around with this nice carton of waters, handing them out to their own people. Nothing for the visiting team. For the timers that are there, and they can't leave their job, okay? They should not have to go to the concession stand and plunk down three bucks to get a bottle of water. That ought to come to them because that's just being hospitable. Home team, I still ask you guys to either call or email in the score of the meet when you're done. I like getting a phone call, believe it or not, because I'm gonna you're gonna probably hear the magic words, how'd it go tonight? And I want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. But the feedback from your meets is really important for me as a league coordinator. I use that info to A. Find out what's working and what's not working. B, if a team is struggling, new coordinator, new coaches, you know, you name it, if they're struggling, sometimes teams are bashful about asking for help. Let me know. Let me try to, you know, I'll reach to them, you know, in a polite manner that doesn't feel like you ratted them out, but say, hey, look, you know, how can I help you? If we got a team that's less than enjoyable to swim against, kind of need to know that. Or if you had a really good experience, I want to know that too. That's how we pick our sportsmanship winner each year. Key jobs for ASA meets. Next slide, please. Pages seven and eight go into a really good detailed description of each job, what they do. I'm going to hit some highlights here. The announcer, home team provides this person. First and foremost, their job is to keep people educated and informed as to what event we're on, what events need to go to the blocks. Hey, nachos are on sale. The pizza just arrived. Keep things moving there. Engage people. Get them to cheer for the kids. And it's okay to be a little bit of a homer. You're, you're at your home pool. But also that person needs to be cognizant of the fact that they don't need to talk over the starter referee. They need to watch what's going on. If the starter is like got kids on the blocks and they're giving them instructions and saying the magic words, take your mark, that's not the time to pick up the mic and go, nachos are now on sale. Nothing drives a ref crazier than having said the words, take your mark, and having that get interrupted by somebody that's got a louder mic than they do. Additionally, that person might think they're the most witty, charming, funny person in the world when they're the most crass, obnoxious, just nasty person. And it's making your neighborhood look really bad in the process. Keep it minimal, okay? If there's music at the pool, which more and more teams are doing, that's fine. But again, it should not be interfering with the swimmer's ability to hear the referee and give commands. It should never be used to cover up thunder. And I've seen teams play fast and loose with that. Oh, you know, I think I heard thunder. Well, just turn the music up a little bit. Nobody will hear that. Well, we kind of need to hear the thunder if it's coming. Okay. Like I said, music is okay. A rave is not. 
timers, two per team, one from that. Again, most meets are going to be run just with stopwatches. You're not using electronic time equipment, two per lane, one person with a stopwatch, one person with a clipboard and a pencil. Okay. And here's why we do it that way. We don't have two watches per lane. If you do it with one stopwatch, one clipboard, it moves the meat far quicker than if you're trying to run with two watches. And here's why. The person with a stopwatch, their only job is start the watch when the race starts, stop the watch when the swimmer touches the wall, tell the person with the clipboard, 1422, that's the time. The person with the clipboard writes the time down. They interface with the person that's going to come by after each race, and they give them the times. They check the name. They talk to the swimmer. The person that's actually timing can do their job much more effectively. And more importantly, as soon as they have told you that time, they can clear their watch. We can move on to the next race. If they're having to stop the watch, write the time down themselves, and try to do it with one time in a lane, the meet takes like 30 minutes longer, believe it or not. And more importantly, they don't do their job very well because they're trying to do five things at once. If we do it with one watch, one clipboard, division of labor, it works really well and runs very efficiently. Deck manager. And going back to the timers real quick, same as I was saying earlier, that needs to be somebody that's probably seen a swim meet before. It's an, it's an important job. We want accuracy in the times. Okay, it's really important to try and get that one right. Deck manager, one per team. This is what I like to call the last line of defense. These are the people that have a fully updated heat sheet that has all the substitutions in it. And their job is behind the blocks as just one last check to make sure the right kid is getting in the right lane and the right heat. They are not going to line all these kids up. That's a bullpen worker. They do that. and Each team does that process separately. Okay, Every team's got their own method to the madness for bullpen operation. We've not tried to really end that in under a specific description because every team's got a different way of doing it, but they tend to do it really well. But the deck manager, they're kind of like a clerk, of course. Their job is behind the blocks, making sure that when that next heat is going on the blocks, it's the correct swimmers. Okay? Answering those last-minute questions, this person needs to be highly organized, good in a chaotic situation, but also very calm, level-headed. They need to be highly organized, okay? And this is where you got to find that nice balance. I've seen deck managers that are really highly organized and real good at keeping people in line, but they scared the living bejesus out of those kids. It's like nobody missed a, nobody missed a race. Nobody got in the wrong lane, but five kids quit the team because they are terrified of that person. Okay, we want to avoid that. You got to strike that happy balance. School teachers always really good at this. They tend to, you know, tend to get this one right. Next slide, please, Evan. Place judges, one per team. The majority of our meets are decided by a place judge. They determine the order of finish. They pretty much sit there on the side of the pool, one from each team, one from the home team, one from the visiting team. They're sitting over the heat sheet in their hands, and their job is specifically is just sit there and write the order of finish on the heat sheet as they see it. They don't call it out. They don't have a discussion or negotiation with the other place judge. Just write down your order of finish. Four, three, six, two. Lane four was first. Lane three was second. Lane six was third, and so on. Okay? And then compare notes. And if they don't agree, then we just simply ask the starter referee to break the tie. It's that simple. It keeps it fair and even. If we get into a situation where we're trying to have a discussion or have a negotiation over this, it just lends itself to, frankly, what I think is an unfair situation, an unbalanced situation where the person with the loudest voice tends to get their way. And it can decide a swim meet. If we do it this way, it works great. Same thing. Needs to be a person that pays attention, detail-oriented, has seen a swim meet before, knows what to look for. Okay? Place judging, again, is not a negotiation. You call it as you see it. The one exception to the one from the home team, one from the visiting team, if you're in an eight-lane pool or a ten-lane pool, 
We bring in a third place judge from the home team. They're going to cover places five and beyond. The one from the home team, one from the visiting team, that is going to be covered by, they're going to cover the first four places. That's the three possible scoring spots plus uh, an extra. So if they disagree. If the place judges disagree again, the only person that breaks the tie is the starter up route. We don't look at the times. We don't look at video. We don't consult with the judges recorder who's sitting there with them. Okay. Again, not a negotiation. Starter up free breaks the tie. If they say, hey, look, I'm sorry, I didn't see it, then the spot's a tie. The computer will split the points and we move on. It's that simple. It does not need to be overcomplicated or overthought. Okay. Any questions so far? All right. Pretty much covered that. Again, they need to have good eyesight, good handwriting. Judges recorder. Next slide, Evan. This is provided by the home team. They're a clerk. They sit with the place judges, and they take the official order of finish and put it on the place judges sheet. So there's a separate place judges sheet that we print out. They're two to a page. We cut them, stack them in order, and that's where the paperwork starts. It starts in the hands of the judges recorder. They'll sit there and record the order of finish. There's a spot across the top where they can write it down logically, okay? And then there's a column for place. They'll transpose it from the top onto the place spot. So when it makes its way to the computer people, they can quickly look at it and go, okay, lane one was fourth, lane four was third, and so on, okay? Remind your judges recorder, you have no say in the order of finish. Keep your opinion to yourself. I always joke, a person that has laryngitis is really good for this job, okay? Do not put the person that just cannot keep their opinion to themselves, don't put them in this job because they'll be sitting there biting their tongue all night long. Master recorder, that's at least one per team. If you've got extra volunteers, this is where you should put them. The master recorder is responsible. Once the judge's recorder gets done recording the order of finish, they're going to hand it off to our master recorder. They will go from lane to lane and get the times. From They'll communicate with the person with the clipboard, okay, what's your time? And they'll write down those times next to the time you know, for that lane. Good handwriting is important. Someone who is physically fit and not claustrophobic is good for that job. They're going to be walking literally miles. You want to get your steps in? That's a good job to do it. They need to have legible handwriting. They need to be not jostled, not, you know, affected by walking through a crowd of people. Some people get real twitchy about that, especially after COVID. Okay. They'll take the form once they've recorded the times. They'll take it to the computer table directly. If the computer table is located in proximity to the pool, or they'll hand it off to a runner. So say the computer people are inside clubhouse, up a flight of steps, far away. Let's keep the paperwork moving in that situation. Okay? Use a runner in those situations to keep the paperwork moving. The important thing here is we don't want these people to hoard the paperwork and go, oh, well, I'll just get the next four races. That slows down everything in the computer operation. This stuff needs to constantly be moving around the deck. So having the extra body, if the home team's got extra people, that's a good place to put them. Runner, optional. I mentioned this. Next slide, Evan. That is, they're used specifically if you have a computer table that's located far, far away. They're used, A, to move that paperwork. And again, same thing. Make sure they know as soon as you get paper, you need to get right to that computer table and get right back to the pool deck as soon as you can. They can also help with, if there's a question about a DQ or a time in a lane or handwriting or whatever else, they can help go back and forth and track down information as it's needed. Computer operator, each team provides one of those. I normally, and I talked about this in the Meet Maestro training, I advise teams, I technically you can use two computers and maybe one person does the boys events, the other person does the girls events. I prefer, honestly, that you use one computer. That job can get done efficiently and effectively with one person sitting at the computer. The person that is not entering times, and again, 
you can work this out any way that you want. Most teams that I see, they trade off the events. One person does the medley relays, the next person steps in and does the freestyle events. And they go back and forth during the evening. That way they have the flexibility to maybe get up and watch their kids swim. They're not chained to a computer for three plus hours. Additionally, the person that's not entering times in the computer can help manage the paperwork. They can sit there and look for situations where the place judges didn't agree with the timers. They say, hey, we need to override the, the place in, you know, event 14. Keep an eye out for that. Hey, we had a DQ in event 15 in lane four. Make sure we get that put into the computer. Then they can also help coordinate and organize that paperwork as the meet goes along. I advise teams when, they, when you're going through the meet, take those place judges forms that have all the information on them, places, the times, or everything's there, beats one through six, whatever. When an event's done, print the result of that event on one sheet of paper and then staple that to all those source documents. That way, if you have to go back and look at an event, everything's right there in one nice, neat stack. It's easy to go back and check things. If you've got a really close meet and you want to audit the results before you announce the score, which the rule book says you should do, it makes that process very easy and quick. But if you just kind of have those things all over the place, hair them, scare them, it gets really complicated trying to go back and piece things back together. Okay. Again, the, the computer operators, they enter the times in the computer, score the events, print the award labels as needed. Teams should share the workload and access to the computer. You should never go to a meet one computer. One team says, oh, yeah, you're, you're not touching that computer tonight. That's ours. A, you really can't do it anyway because all this stuff's cloud-based. So that's not really an issue. But B, it's just in, trans in the idea of transparency, it's just a lot easier to go, hey, if you need to get in there and you know make, make adjustments, put your last-minute substitutions in, you should be able to do so. Okay. Key jobs for ASA meets continue. Next slide, awards. They just peel the labels, stick the labels on the ribbons, put them in the team organizer, the box, the file folder, whatever they've got. Every team's got a different way of doing this. Some teams actually will wait till the end of the meet and just print all the labels out when everything's done for their team. Or again, you've got access to this stuff. It's cloud-based. So if your team wants to do it that way, you're welcome to do it. The only challenge with that is it makes that whole heat one thing a little bit more challenging to make sure you get the adequate number of ribbons. I honestly, it's like the best job in the world to have. The newer parent that doesn't have a lot of experience with swimming, that's a good spot to put them. It's a real simple job. It's usually in a nice air conditioned place. Good way to, you know, you can socialize, do whatever you want to do. Like I said, some teams, they want to print them at the end go home, sit in front of the TV, turn Netflix on, glass of wine, and he'll stick and go, okay? It's up to each team as to how they want to do it. Bullpen, it's technically not listed in the rule book. Here's why. Like I said, every team's got a different way of getting kids from the team area to the blocks. Most teams in general, they usually have one parent or two parents, if it's a really big age group, oversee like 600 boys. 600 girls, one parent with a T-shirt, an apron, you know, funny hat, whatever, whatever identifies them. They get those nice check-in sheets. They can use those to help keep these kids organized and get them to the blocks and get them organized. So when the deck manager's doing their job, they're just going, okay, you're Billy, you're Sally, you're Steve, you're Jeff, we're good, okay? Again, you want a parent that is good with kids, patient, organized to do this job. Otherwise, it's chaos. They get in the wrong lanes, fouls up the results. It's no bueno. Next slide, please. The general timeline for meets covered on pages 18 through 20. Lineup exchange, all this stuff starts, again, well in advance before any of this stuff started. We had a conversation several days in advance of the meet to work out those general details. When are you getting here? When are you warming up? Where are we sitting? Where are we parking? We have these concessions. We take cash, we take Venmo. Some clubs are more restrictive about allowing outside food in. Communicate that stuff in advance so it's not a surprise. Okay, the more details you can work out, the better. 
hey, I looked at the weather. Doesn't look good for this week. What are we going to do? Hey, we're the home team. If we hit bad weather, this is what we do. So, you know, you flip the switch, you know, we got to get everybody off this deck. It helps a lot if both teams know what's going to happen. And you've communicated well in advance via email, text, whatever else you've got to do to let the parents know, hey, guys, we hit bad weather. This is what we're going to do. This is how long we're going to wait. This is where we need to go to be safe. Okay? We have a lot more tools at our disposal. Thank, thank God for technology. Communicate with people. It's a lot easier. But it just helps to know in advance what to look for. Line of exchange, again, should take place by 3 p.m. the day before the meet. Teams can agree to a later time, but shouldn't be much later than 6 p.m. I still like having that stuff done. The computer can go in there and merge everything, everything get, get put together. And then that way, both teams can go in, print out all the paperwork they want, get word out to the families. Hey, this is what your kids are swimming tomorrow. Okay. Communicate with each other if you're having issues. If you said, hey, we're going to do it at three, but you're running behind, just clue the other team in. Don't ghost them on this stuff. Upload your entries into Sotopia. Mark is ready, and it's ready to be merged at that point. The home team's going to merge it. If for some reason they're having issues, the visiting team can do it just as easily. But technically, the home team ought to do this. The merge should take place no later than 10 p.m. the night before the meet and should be done as early as possible. So, again, it's a lot easier to deal with this. In high tech, it took like 20 or 30 minutes to merge a meet. It was a lot of tedious, busy work. That's not the case with Meet Maestro. Again, keep the swimmers in existing events. Again, Meet Maestro takes care of trimming down the number of heats as best they can. The one thing it doesn't do is look for opportunities to combine events. The home team needs to take the lead on that. So if you look and it's like 13, 14 girls, 13, 14 boys, we have two relays total amongst all the teams. They ought to swim together. Save the heat. Every heat you save, is anywhere from one to three minutes. It's a big deal. These meets ought to get done in about three and a half hours. Okay? If you're not getting done in three and a half hours, either you better have had bad weather or you better have a jillion kids near in a four-lane pool. The really big teams are able to swim against each other and still get these things done before it gets dark. If you're looking for the one thing that people gripe about about swimming, it's the length of the meet. So again, look for opportunities to save heats. To deal with that, again, we talked about the meet maestro training. You would manually move the kids, put the girls in lane three, put the boys in lane four, do it in advance. And then that way everybody knows what's going on and communicate with the other team. Hey, we combine events three and four. We combine events 17 and 18. Make sure your bullpen people know this is going on. Make sure the deck managers know what's going on. Make sure the starter referee knows what's going on, okay? Check the other team's entries when you do lineup exchange. As soon as you get the other team's lineup and the meets merge, go in and run a check-in report and look age group by age group. And if there are any issues, hey, you've got five, one kid entered in five events, you've got two kids, the rest of your kids are entered in two events. That's not allowed by the league rules. We have eight heats of exhibition relays in the nine and 10 girls. That shouldn't happen. Address those things then and there. And that's not a call to me. That's a call to the other team. Polite, hey, I think you messed this up. We need to correct this. If they refuse to correct it, then feel free to call me at that point. I'll sit there and advocate for you. Next slide, please, Evan. Substitution. So once you've exchanged lineups to the other team, you are allowed to only change events for kids that are unable to be at the meet. It's what we call legal substitutions. And they can take the form of, so, you know, you do the line of exchange. Next day you show up, these 10 kids are sick. These 10 kids swore they were going to be there. And they're like, nope, going to the Braves game. Sorry, not coming. We've moved to Alaska. We're never coming back. We're off the swim team. You know, take your pick. Okay. In those situations, you're allowed to fill in for those kids and fill the holes. I talked about that in detail in the, in the rules meeting. The process of substitution, though, can take place up to 30 minutes before the meet starts. But the one thing I always tell teams is 
Don't do them all 30 minutes before the meet starts. Do it throughout the day. Do it literally. As soon as practice is over, swap emails to the other team. Hey, these 10 kids are out. These 10 kids are going in. I will make the changes in Meet Maestro. And the changes take place in Meet Maestro. You don't do them in Swimtopia where you did your entries originally and try and remerge the meet. It'll throw all the good work you did with combining events and any other maneuvers you've made. It'll throw them out the window and remerge the meet based on the times only, which makes it really no bueno. Okay. I suggest doing this maybe noon, one o'clock. Also, circle back with the opposing team around maybe three o'clock before you pack up and go to the pool. And then that way, by the time you get to the pool, it should only be just a handful. You know, maybe 10% of the overall substitutions you have to make are the last minute ones. So you're able to focus on getting kids checked in, warmed up, lined up, and ready to go. And you're able to print all this revised paperwork as early as possible because there are revised bits of paperwork that you have to print to be able to be operational and run the meet. Paperwork. Home team prints the heat sheets for the you know, general operation of the meet. They'll print the lane timer worksheets. They'll print the place judges forms for the meet. They'll cut those forms and stack them in order for the judges recorder. This can be done as early as the night before, or if you've got time carved out the day of, if you can get more of those substitutions on the original paperwork, that's all the better. But if you've got a day job, which a lot of people do, and you're gonna be getting to the pool at four o'clock to start doing this stuff, that is not the time to print. A report that's going to have 80 pages that has to be cut in half and restacked. Okay. Some forms are obviously going to have revised versions, the heat sheet being the biggest one after all the substitutions are in. I normally tell teams print the place judges forms, print the lane timer sheets early. Those should be done, ready to go, stapled on clipboards by three o'clock day of the meeting. You shouldn't have to print revised lane timer sheets. Again, it's more a matter of if you have the, the bodies and the, the ability to print it later, then go for it. But if it's going to gum up the works for you to be able to do your job effectively and get started on time and I go back to the meet taking three and a half hours, it is real hard to get done on that window if you're starting 15 minutes late because you had to print, you know, a thousand different things for the meet to start. Okay. That's also where having that other team's computer there and other printer will help expedite some of that stuff. Check-in sheets, those can be printed by either team. Those are usually used by your bullpen people, coaches and parents, and they can be emailed to the parents in Swintopia. Heat sheets, copies for parents can be printed by each team. And you can get those out, put them in PDF format, send them out to the parents. Okay, it may not include all the substitutions, but it's gonna be 90 plus percent accurate. Timer worksheets, again, don't print it last minute. They got to be stapled and put on clipboards. Begin printing after a majority of the substitutions are done. Place judges forms, again, print them early. Okay. To deal with revisions on the place judges form, you've got two options. One, you can print individual events in that place judges form, or you can just honestly write it on there manually. It's just as easy as long as it gets changed in the computer correctly. Next slide, please. Revised paperwork. This is where I always advise teams have a couple of reams of colored paper on hand. Because you're gonna, you're gonna print a revised heat sheet. And ideally you'll print somewhere between 12 and 20 of these if possible. Okay, and here are the people that need to have those. The referee's gotta have one, the announcer needs one, the deck, each deck manager needs one, each place judge should have one. Then two to three or more copies for each team's coach. Printing them on colored paper easily identifies them as that's the one that's got all the changes in it. Bright yellow is a great color. Like a pastel pink is a good color. Like a dark green or blue, terrible color, especially as it gets darker, okay? Bright neon pastel colors are great options. Place judges forms again, you can reprint, you know, just the events, or you can just do it manually by writing on them. Next slide, please. BYOC slash P. Bring your own computer and printer. 
Visiting teams should bring their stuff as well. Having spares there always helps. Okay. Do not show up as visiting team and ask for 100 heat sheets. That's rude. Asking for maybe five or six, not rude. That's a reasonable request, especially if it's a revised one. But having your own printer there gives you the ability to do the stuff yourselves. Next slide, please. Pre-meet meetings. Coaches should meet with the meet referee before the meet starts. Go over details. Who am I going to notify about DQs? How lenient are we going to be in that first meet? Okay, are we going to have a little bit of, you know, a little bit of leniency for the kids in the first meet because the water was freezing cold for most of April and part of May? The referees should meet with the timers and place judges to make sure they understand the roles and duties. However, each team needs to instruct their people as to how to do their jobs. Deliver ready-made people. The rest just checking and making sure, hey, you know how to work your watch. You know what you're doing. We know that we have one person with a stopwatch, one person with a clipboard. The ref should introduce themselves to each team rep, especially since you're the ones that are paying them at the end of the meet. Start of the meet, you call the first three events about five to 10 minutes before that first race is supposed to splash. So they're at the blocks and lined up and ready to go. Make sure your bullpens and coaches get the kids to the blocks in a timely fashion and that the kids are ready to swim. The refs are instructed to run these things quickly. However, there is such a thing as going too fast. If you do that, you're going to have the kids missing races. They get in the wrong lanes, and it's just a bad experience. We want to avoid that. Fast is good. Too fast is bad. If the ref's doing that, be delicate about how you communicate with them. And go, hey, look, we're lost. We, we need you to just take a beat. Just give us an extra, you know, extra, you know, 20 seconds or whatever you know, before we're going to start. And, you know, if you need a couple of minutes, then, then take it. But be, again, cooperative in that process of communication. Again, they'll step them up, start them, they'll swim. Timers do their job. Place judges do their job. Recorders do their job. Computer people do their job. Rinse and repeat about 80 times, and you've got to swim me. Post me. The home team's either going to call, email, or text the final score to me as soon as you're done. Don't do it the next day. We want to try and get that info back out to teams as quickly as possible. So ideally, you know, by Friday at noon, I've got everything in hand. So I usually start in advance of the meet. You know, I'll know some general ideas for the newsletter, but the big portion of that newsletter, I'd love to have all the scores for all the meets. The next two slides, so you've got this. And on the page behind it describes how all this works and interacts. This is just kind of a visual diagram, a physical diagram to show you kind of where everybody is, where they're going and what they're doing. So if you, if you look at the start of the meet, your swimmers are lined up here. You've got your little stopwatches or timers, okay? You've got your judges recorder here. you got your place judges here, right on the side of the pool. Starter referee is going to stand next to them. So they're all in nice, tight proximity. Your deck manager, they're either going to be here for a 25-yard race on the opposite side, or they'll be behind the blocks for anything 50, 100, or 200 yards. Okay. Computer table, ideally, would be nice and close to the pool. But again, that's, that's different for every pool. If you notice MR1 and MR2, that little loop shows their, their path. So it's going to start with the judges, the judges recorder here. They record their info for the place judges, hand it off to the master recorder. They loop around, hit every time or get the times, and then take it to the computer table. So again, starting point is the deck manager from each team checks the right swimmers in the right lanes. Each place judge records the order of finish independently at the end of the race on their meet program, their heat sheet, and then they just compare notes. If they agree, they communicate it to the judge's recorder. If they disagree, they communicate with the starter referee to have them break the tie. And the judge's recorder then records the official order finish onto their copy of the place judge's form. They will then hand that piece of paper off to the master recorder who goes from lane to lane, getting times from your timing recorder. Okay. 
again, the more bodies you can throw at that job, the better. It speeds up the process of getting that paperwork to the computer people. There are two people working in each lane as timers, T1 and T2. One person operates the stopwatch. One person operates the clipboard. Once the master record is recorded all the times, they hand that form off to a runner or they just take it straight to the computer table if it's right by the pool. Again, the home team would provide the runner if one is needed. Each team provides a computer operator. They input that data into the computer. Meet Maestro does its magic, calculates scores, and we rinse and repeat. Each team's got a ribbon person. Again, you'll print those ribbons at the convenience of the computer people. Their primary function is, is getting those times in, not falling behind and trying to be as accurate as possible. But usually most computer people will print those ribbon labels and they're doing it during the meet, usually about every five to 10 events or maybe every stroke break. Any questions so far? All right, bad weather. Next slide. It's summer in Atlanta, you're gonna hit the thunderstorm at, at least once, probably twice. Rules on how we deal with this are covered real clearly in the ASA rule book on page 20. First and foremost, every team ought to have an evacuation plan that is clear, understood, and communicated to everybody well in advance of the meet. Your primary concern at that situation is the safety of everybody there. We immediately stop caring about who's gonna win the swim meet when it thunders or lightnings. That is an immediate, very big risk that we wanna take with the due seriousness it requires. Look at the weather several days in advance. Ideally, that nice big blob of sun is going to be sitting around the forecast. Might be hot, but you'll be good to go. And if it looks bad, have the conversation in advance of the meet. How long are you willing to wait? Okay. The league has internal processes in this rule to, if you can't agree, the league specifies you're only going to wait essentially about 45 minutes total in weather delays. And then you're going to, move on to phase two, which is either reschedule the meet, call the meet, call the meet with one team winning, call the meet to tie. And again, those steps and processes are listed out very clearly in the rule book. But knowing in advance, hey, let's wait till 7.30. You know, we've got plenty of daylight. Our pool is well lit. And that can be a big factor of the conversation is your pool have lights. Some pools are not very well lit, not equipped to swim past dark. And it's, it's a safety issue. So again, factor that in, communicate in advance. If you're gonna reschedule, figure out the date well in advance. Okay, and look at the weather on that one too. Okay, Saturday morning usually works really well. Communicate that game plan with parents as best you can in advance. Again, your first concern when bad weather hits, you get everyone to safety, then figure out what to do with the meat. But ideally, you would have figured out what to do with meat before you even had the conversation. Options are, you can wait for the weather to clear. You can reschedule. You can use virtual meet to solve it. Those have become a great option. Or the biggest one we, we see teams do, hey, we can't figure this out. There's not going to be a chance for us to restart. We can't reschedule. We're, we're not far enough into the meet to determine a winner. Call it a tie. Both teams get a win. We move on, live to fight another day. Okay? Ideally, you'll avoid that. We want the kids to be able to swim, but sometimes – you just find a situation that's the only option that's on the table. And it's a fair one, okay? Both teams walk out of there with a win. You know, it's not great they didn't get to swim, but you at least got some swimming in. And, you know, like I said, nobody gets penalized in that situation. If you reschedule, grab your ref right then. Hey, can you come back on this day? If they say no, that's an immediate phone call or email to me. Hey, we need a replacement. I see it happen every year. Teams go through everything. The handle is perfectly, do a great job. They forget one small thing. They forgot to tell me that they rescheduled the meet and the ref wasn't available. And you're like, Friday, eat Friday afternoon. You're there like, hey, we all a ref. I'm like, a ref for what? You didn't tell me you had a meet. Okay. If they can't come, you know, get, get me on the horn. I'll, I'll get it sorted out quickly. Other stuff, your feedback is really crucial throughout the year. I want to hear the good, the bad, and the ugly. Hopefully it's good, but every once in a while you run into situations that are 
you know, you run into a team that you just can't quite get along with. Okay. You run into a person. It's usually not an entire team. It's like one person that fouls it up for everybody. If that happens, let me know. Okay. Let me know how your reps are doing. We, like you, when finding coaches, struggle sometimes to find enough bodies. So if we got newbies in there and they're not quite cutting the, cutting the mustard, we need to know so we can work with these people. And if you probably don't want to see them again, then let us know. And we can probably make adjustments to the existing schedule. Let us know about teams that are struggling that aren't quite, you know, grasping how we do all this stuff. We want to engage with them and try and help them out and offer out as much support as we can. And again, people are always bashful about going, hey, I need help. It just, I don't know why, but sometimes it's the way people are wired. If you've got a better way of doing this stuff, let me know. Okay, if you come from somewhere else and it's, we've got some magic way of shaving 20 minutes off the meat and making everyone a lot happier, I'm all for it. I'll be glad to share with everybody. But we've got this stuff from our perspective and the way our league's operated. I think we got this stuff dialed into a pretty good, efficient operation. Again, I'm always open to feedback and ideas. Send out a weekly newsletter, including weekly scores and standings. Keep the lines of communication open. But just again, it makes your job so much easier and better. And it makes it so much easier to deal with a crazy parent. When you can sit there and go, look, you've got a text. It's on the web page. I sent you an email. I sent you another email. I sent you another text. And oh, by the way, it's on the website. Where did you miss this? Where did you not get the memo? I've done everything on my end possible to let you know what's going on with this me. You chose just to frankly ignore all that. And that's a you problem, not a me problem. Uh, again, remember, it's summer league. It's supposed to be fun and enjoyable and happy. Okay? But that doesn't mean just free for all. We're just going to do whatever we feel like doing today. We try and have some sort of game plan in this stuff. And it served us well through the years. So I know it's a lot of stuff that we talked about. But um, hopefully it was helpful and useful. Do you all have any questions? My kind of crowd. Well, it's still light outside. We can get out of here and don't forget your ribbons. But if y'all think of anything else you need during the year, don't be bashful about asking. I want to be 